Hello! Today's stories come from r slash pro revenge. We have three stories today of people getting their just desserts. Or would it be justice desserts? Let's start with our first story titled Bag of Nails. I am a dry liner, which means I do a lot of moving around for my trade as most of the work I do is towards the end of most projects. This means that I spend a lot of my time renting flats and houses for only short periods usually about six months at a time. This has meant that I have had to deal with a lot of landlords over the years, both good and bad. When it comes to the bad landlords, I will normally just walk away and get on with moving to the next job and take the loss of my deposit and never use them again if I am working in that area in the future. But this particular landlord got my back up so badly, I was not just going to walk away. I had managed to get myself onto a big job in London working on the new Wembley Stadium, so decided I would look for a house to rent rather than a flat, as I know I was going to be working on it for a while, and found a reasonably priced for London house to rent from a private landlord in a local newspaper. I gave him a call and met with him later that day. He seemed okay, went to view the house, paid him the deposit in cash, and moved in that weekend. I ended up staying in the house for nearly a year with no problems. Always had the rent paid into his bank account on time and fixed any small problems that might crop up with the house myself without bothering him. Up to the time when it came to moving out, only ever spoke to him twice on the phone after there was an issue with the heating that I was unable to fix myself and he sent an engineer around the next day to fix the boiler. Come the time the job was finishing, I went around to the pawn shop that he owned to give him notice that I would be moving out the following month and to let him know that I was happy for him to come round to inspect the house before I moved out so that I could get my deposit back from him when I returned the keys. He never came round while I was in to inspect the house, and so I assumed that he had come round and let himself in while I was at work, as I had told him that I had no issue with him doing that if need be. So on the day I moved out, I went around the shop and handed him his keys back and asked for my deposit. His response was, what deposit? The month's rent that I gave you in advance of moving in as a security deposit, I replied. He then told me he was keeping that to cover the cost of repairing damages caused while I was living in the property. I responded, what damages? With the bits of work and decorating I had done on the house, it was in a better state now than when I had moved into it. His response was to step forward and get right up into my face and say, you're not getting it back, so F off. And he then gave me a shove which needed me to take three steps back to avoid falling on my arse. Now, I am what you would class as average size and built, and this landlord had a good four inches on me height-wise, and obviously spent some time down in the gym, and the wise move would be to back away and cut my losses. Now, before I was a builder, I was a member of the British Army in a regiment called the Royal Green Jackets, and they had trained us that the best way to proceed when confronted with aggression is to meet it swiftly and with much more violent aggression. So without even thinking about it, I started to move forward with the full intention of dropping this tit quickly and painfully. After the first step through, a thought popped into my head like a bolt from the blue. So I stopped and took a moment to examine the idea from a few different angles, said, okay, bye, to my now ex-landlord and walked out of his shop. What the landlord did not know was that I had had a spare backdoor key cut when I had lived in the house which I had stashed in my van in case I ever lost the key so I could still get back in. So later that evening, I let myself back in and decided to stop for one last night before leaving in the morning for my next job, which was in Scotland. I spent the last night in the house carefully removing every bit of wood in there. I took down doors, removed skirting boards, banisters, architrave, and floorboards, being extremely careful not to damage anything. I also completely dismantled all the kitchen units, took up the wood flooring and carpets. I then left everything in nice, neat piles in each room. I got in my van the next morning and was preparing to start my drive when I decided I wanted to rub a little more salt into my ex-landlord's wounds. So I stopped at a shop on the way out of London, got a spare hammer, screwdriver, bag of nails, and box of wood screws out of the back of my van and went into the shop. My ex-landlord was not there, probably for the best. So I left the tools with his confused-looking assistant and told her to tell her boss, you will be needing these, and left for my drive north. I had my phone switched off while driving, and a few hours later, while I was having a bite to eat in a service station up by Nottingham, 
I decided to switch it back on and was greeted by a string of text messages and some very colorful voice messages, which left me chuckling to myself. Edit. I did reply to one of the texts he sent me. The text was, Do you think you're effing funny leaving me nails and screws? I responded, Yes. Too funny. There's something about the professional revenge stories that I really like. This landlord could have still come out way ahead if he had just given the deposit back. The place probably did look way better since OP was in it for a year. And if he had a good gig in the stadium build, chances are he'd take some personal time to tune up his own place. Let's jump to the comments where Dryliner is defined for us North Americans. And as a special treat, there are some extra spicy options OP could have explored. Rex McRider said, So, for any fellow Yanks out there wondering, as I was, Dryliner. Dryliners use plasterboard and panels to build internal walls, suspended ceilings, and raised flooring in houses, offices, and shops. So, basically, he's the drywall guy and the floor guy and the T-bar guy all in one. Correct me if I'm wrong, like you need to ask on the internet. OP replied, that's a good description. Also need to have a good working knowledge of carpentry and plastering as well. Katie TM said, you should have switched the doors and skirting into different rooms to make it a puzzle. This landlord probably does this to every tenant. Prickly Pearseed added, this is the way. Sean BZA said, hopefully the bag of nails were all a bit short and thin and the screws were all just big enough to crack the wood unless you drilled a pilot hole, hammer missing a wedge and the screwdriver with a rounded off tip. Stupid Reddit user 13 said, you're one sick mother effer. This is amazing. As Avera piled it on with, add in some extra trim and parts in the piles to make him wonder if he forgot to redo something. Our next two stories get into an automotive theme, but spoiler alert, the fraudsters don't get away with it. Our second story is titled, How I Got a Car Dealership to Give My Friend a Newer Car. Circa 2020 January, my friend makes a stupid decision and buys a brand new car he can't afford. His insurance is like $400 a month. He makes like $10.25 an hour working as a shift supervisor at McDonald's. His car payment is like $795 a month. Now, at $10.25 an hour, 30 hours a week, that's a weekly income of about $300 a week or about $1,230 a month. So yeah. So my friend came to me for help because I used to sell cars and know the industry pretty well. I go over his paperwork. The dealer did rip him off, but my friend is trying to find a way to get out of this mess. And ripping someone off isn't illegal. They did, of course, overcharge him for warranty. They gave him a higher APR. They had add-ons, etc. But none of that is illegal, and I know the only way I can get my friend out of this deal is if they did something illegal. So I look at his finance application that my friend signed. It correctly listed his income, which turned a light bulb on in my head. No bank is going to approve someone for a $795 a month car payment if they are only making $1,200 a month. It does not make mathematical sense to do that. So I start searching through his paperwork for the finance app the dealer submitted to the bank. Oftentimes, when you submit a finance application at a dealership, the dealership will take the hand-filled out application and reproduce it electronically. This is pretty normal. However, on the application the dealer submitted to the bank, the dealer said my friend was a GM of the McDonald's and made $70,000. My friend had good credit, so it doesn't appear like the bank asked for proof of income. So I go to the dealership with my friend and tell the sales manager he's going to want to put me in touch with the GM because we are going to be unwinding my friend's deal and giving him his trade-in back. The sales manager thought I was joking. The GM also thought I was joking. Then I demonstrated how his dealership finance department committed bank fraud. I showed the GM the finance app my friend filled out. I then showed the GM the finance app his dealership submitted to the bank and pointed at the income difference. My friend really made $14,000 a year. The dealership claimed my friend made $70,000 a year. That's bank fraud. That's a felony. Let's keep this simple, shall we? The GM sees his dealership is in a load of crap. The proof I am presenting to him is rock solid. He knows it. I know it. We are all on the same page. He goes, okay, so what can I do to make this right? I go, unwind the deal, give my friend his trade-in back. Unwinding the deal is basically the GM agreeing to cancel the deal and basically erasing the deal and pretending it never happened. 
GM tries to avoid that, but I remain firm and remind him we can easily take this documentation and turn his life into a living nightmare. He knows I'm right. My friend also needs a car to get to work the next day. The GM says he'll check into it. He comes back and tells me, unfortunately, they sold his trade-in already. I said, that's fine. Unwind the deal and let's put my friend into something as good or slightly better than what he traded in for. So the GM goes, so he'll buy a car similar to his trade-in? I said, no, you'll give him a car similar to his trade-in. The GM goes, it doesn't work that way. I go, it does when you commit bank fraud. GM is upset with me and I remind him, I'm being really nice and this situation can totally get really ugly. Like felony level charges ugly. Like losing your franchise ugly. So yeah, this is going to hurt. But it's going to hurt less my way. So the GM goes, all right. And he looks in his inventory and he tells me they have a 2007 Focus with 10,000 more miles. I tell him, no, the car you give my friend needs to be the same or better than what he traded in. The GM counters. I'm giving him a free car. And I go, no, you took his trade in. You sold it. You made money on that sale. You also committed a felony in the process of selling him his new car. You are now correcting that mistake. This isn't a free car for my friend. This is a you are correcting your mistake. GM insists that's what he's willing to do. I tell him if he can't do better then, that we will go to a consumer protection attorney and have a conversation with them. My friend didn't want to go this route, but it was our plan B. We get to get up. The GM says, wait, give me a second. The GM goes, I have an 08 Civic. It has 5,000 more miles, but it's a Civic and not a Focus. I unwind the deal on the new car and put your friend in the Civic at no extra cost. We agree. GM has the paper drawn up. The old loan on the new car is canceled. They take in the new car again, but because it's already titled, they'll have to sell it as used. That sucks for them. And they gave my friend a better car than the one he traded in. For people asking why we didn't get a lawyer involved from the start, we could have done that. But courts take a long time, and this was a faster way to fix the situation. Ugh, car dealerships, eh? OP's friend is really lucky that he had him. Otherwise, he would have been up a creek. He would have never known what the dealership did in the first place, and this would have destroyed his credit. OP is the hero in this story. Let's check out the comments where OP shares more of the shenanigans that happen in the industry. Roxfly said, good pro revenge, but do your friend a favor and get them into a financial literacy class. The dealer is a criminal, but your friend was an idiot for getting into the situation. Brawlypop said, also, dealer has done this before and will do it again. Nadmaster101 said, I'm sorry that happened to your friend. Truly shady. However, I would still report it after everything. I'm willing to bet this isn't the first nor last time that dealership is willing to commit fraud to make a deal and screw someone else over. OP replied, it's actually a really common practice. Dealerships will often lie about income to get customers higher approval figures so they can get the cars the consumer wants. I personally feel it goes both ways. Is the dealership committing fraud? Yes. And a lot of times the consumer is fine with this because their desire for their car overrides their logic. Dejour one said, I knew a lawyer who specialized in going after dealerships. His biggest case was a multi-million dollar settlement because a Toyota dealership was putting TRD, turd, stickers on their trucks and misrepresenting them to buyers. He had lots of stories about things like that. Dimitrov said, the irony being that most buyers were probably pavement princesses who only wanted the stickers anyway. OP replied, not going to lie. Once I had a customer that really wanted a Mustang GT, but he couldn't afford a Mustang GT. So I made him a deal. He buys an EcoBoost Mustang, and I'll have my service department put the GT badge on his car. Badging is cheap. He said, yes, we did the deal. We put the GT badge on his car. But we weren't lying to the customer. The customer knew what was going on. Our third story is something we've all heard of or seen videos of and spawned the dash cam industry. The story is called, I won over $5,000 for in court after a car accident that I caused? Okay, so just a little bit of info before I get into the story. Also, sorry this might get a little long, but I hope it's worth it. I'm a 22-year-old male working construction, and I run a few crews, and I'm a foreman because I've been working in this field since I started working summers when I was 14. That's legal age in my state. With this being said, I have a lot of experience and get paid really well. 
For my job, I need a truck that can pull a lot of trailers and also get into a lot of sketchy job sites, especially in the winter. So I drive a new lifted pickup, F-350. Anyway, let's get into it. So about four months ago now, I got off work one day and just really didn't feel like making dinner. So I decided to go get myself the trusty Big Mac at McDonald's. Well, after I got my order, I was going to pull out into the parking lot to drive home, and I was looking hard over to my left to see how busy the road was before I got over there. Well, I wasn't paying great attention to what was happening in front of me, and as I was creeping forward, someone who was in front of me was stopped and not paying attention either. I ended up barely hitting his mirror and scraping his door with my front end. I immediately reversed and hopped out. I made sure the guy was okay and apologized knowing it was my fault, and I asked him if he wanted to call the cops. Let's call him Brent. Brent says, nah, bro, we're all good. If you just get me your insurance info, I think we can get this taken care of. I was fine with that, as there was no damage done to my truck, and it's not required to call the cops for an accident if it occurs in a private parking lot. We exchange info, and he seems pretty cool, so I tell him to go get the damage bid, and I'll just pay in cash so my insurance rates don't go up as long as he's okay with it. He says that's fine and we both just leave and I feel like a moron. But all in all, Brent seems like a cool dude and I just hope we can get it sorted out smoothly. About a month passes by and I haven't heard anything from Brent or the shop I told him to go to. Honestly, I wasn't too stressed about this because if he decided to not get it done, that's on him. Well, he calls me up one day at about noon saying he can't remember my name and he wanted to tell the guys at the shop who sent him there because it seemed like we knew each other. I told him my name, and the guys at the shop gave him a deal. Pretty sure they say this to everyone. (laughs) He sends me the bid for damages, and it comes out to $2,403. This was more than I imagined, but I said to get it done, and I'd take care of the bill afterward. And that was that. He hung up, said it was cool, and I went on with my day as usual. Another month goes by, and I don't hear anything until Brent calls me up while I'm at work again and says, Hey, brother. I talked to the shop and they said they can't get me in for another two weeks or so, and they may end up charging me more if they find more damage. I say, okay, sounds good. Just let me know, man. I hope it goes smooth for you and I'm sorry for the inconvenience. He seems to take it good and I'm really trying to just be a good person. He responds with, well, after talking to my wife, I'm okay if you just wanted to write a check for 2,500 and we can call it even. This seemed odd to me because why the heck wouldn't someone want their vehicle repairs all paid for? I say, okay, man, let's set a time and a place to meet and I'll get you paid. He liked the idea and ended the call by telling me he would let me know. Yet another month passes by and I hear nothing again. At this point, I'm getting fed up and just want the situation to stop being over my head. He hits me up at 11 p.m. one night and asks if we can meet in town. I found this kind of disrespectful because I was nearly asleep and had to be at work at 5 a.m. the next day. Either way, I said that was fine and took my $2,500 cash. I wrote up a quick contract saying this payment would be accepted as payment in full for the damages and by accepting it, it would release me from any and all liability. This was a pretty fair contract, I believe, as it was the deal we had already made over the phone, just in writing. I get to the place we suggested as a meetup spot. I give him the cash and he signs the contract without hardly even reading it and he didn't want the copy. This was a red flag to me, but I just assumed he really didn't care about it all that much. So I just send him the photo of the contract and go back home for some beauty sleep. As you can guess by now, another effing month goes by with me just living life carefree and not a worry in the world about this stupid car accident. Well, I go back to check my mail and I have a notice from this guy's lawyer that he is suing me for not paying after wrecking his car. This upset me but I also knew I had plenty of text messages and a contract on my side. I immediately call Brent and he blocks my number. Luckily enough, my girlfriend works for a lawyer, so I get him updated and he says he'd love to help. He lets me know I saved my butt by writing that contract as any contract worth over $500 is to be held up in any level court in my state. I immediately get to work on my revenge. I remember on the side of this guy's car, he had a business logo and I took pictures of the damage. So I hop online and get to the BBB, Better Business Bureau, to look up who owns this company, thinking that surely he couldn't own the business because he is such an idiot. I was wrong. This guy owns the company, and I can see that he has had about 12 one-star reviews all in dispute because of his shady business practices telling people it will cost one thing 
and then charging them four times what he said it would. Sound familiar? Remember when he said the shop may charge more than the original $2,403? That's right. He was suing me for $10,000, four times what the shop told him it would cost. Unbelievable. He was trying his same sneaky crap on me. My lawyer takes note of this, and we show up to court ready for war. This guy is sleazy. As we get there and all set up, he says, you ready to give me more of daddy's money? With a smirk. I guess just because I'm young and drive a nice truck and could afford $2,500. His lawyer gets up and starts trying to say BS from me hitting and running, and Brent barely got a picture of my license plate, to I tried bullying him into taking a deal for only $2,500 when the damage was clearly more than that. There were obvious holes in his story, and he really didn't have much to say. Just imagine the smile on my face as my lawyer lays out the printouts of our text messages and the physical copy of the contract, which was signed by Brent. His lawyer was ghostly white and looked sick. After laying out all of the evidence, my lawyer pulled out a little hidden gem, the printouts of all the complaints we found on the BBB and how he was doing the same thing to me. That was the final nail in the coffin as the judge said he had seen enough. He asked Brent for any final statements and Brent said, I don't even have the $2,500 anymore. Can I just get that then and we will be okay? Admitting to the judge that he had received my money and his story was just a load of horse crap, I thought his lawyer was gonna strangle him. It was beautiful. The judge ended up ruling in my favor and demanded him to pay my legal fees as well as damages and lost wages because I had to miss work to be in court. The absolute sweetest part was that this particular day my crew was on a very high-wage job and I was technically the only one getting paid before I paid them out as subcontractors. This means I was to be paid $475 per hour and this whole ordeal took about five hours. He ended up having to pay me almost $5,000. I don't think I've ever been so happy in my life. Sorry it was so long. I just really felt the need to share. Thank you to anyone who made it this far. What a gem of a story. OP was just trying to be a good person. This is karma in action, my friends. We're going to skip the usual top comments in favor of two anecdotes from other Redditors. Let's check them out. Minute 27 shares. Me and my buddy were at the bar one night and he tapped a car coming out of his spot. Super small mark on the car and the owner agrees to not call the cops. They initially wanted to fight, but got over that pretty quick. My buddy said to just give him the bill and he'd take care of it. A couple days go by and the guy says they got lucky. It's just going to be a small paint touch-up. Should only cost a couple hundred. My buddy meets up with him and he gives him cash. A week goes by and the guy calls and says they discovered the whole bumper is cracked so it's going to be another $500. My buddy shows up, gives the guy the money. A couple more days and my buddy gets a call saying the frame is bent and it's going to be a couple grand. I tell him not to answer the phone anymore. This dude is obviously shaking him down. He wasn't even hitting the gas when he hit the car. We were doing maybe one mile per hour. There's no way he caused any real damage. Dude called him a few times, but eventually gave up. Funkytown13 said, The next call. Now you're in real trouble. Turns out I died and you have a wrongful death suit on your hands. Vulcan1358 had this to share. My brother had an issue where he was backing out of a spot at a gas station and knocked the mirror off a car. He had just realized it after he started to drive forward. So we pulled into another spot, grabs his info and heads into the gas station to find the owner of said vehicle. Meanwhile, the owner had exited the store, saw the damage and came back inside whilst berating the clerk for security camera footage because she thought that she was a victim of hit and run. My brother proceeds to dive on this Karen grenade, admits fault and lays out her options. The mirror was knocked off, but all the electric components still held it on and the motors that moved it still worked, so likely a cheaper fix. He provides his info, including his phone number if she wants to keep it off insurance, get an estimate, and he'll pay the shop for repairs. Karen's gonna Karen, so she's talking about getting insurance and filing a police report and all the above. Since my brother was smart and took pictures, they showed that this lady parked in the loading zone of a handicap spot. You know, the lines next to it designated for the wheelchair ramp to come down out of a van. Since she brought it to insurance, my brother was found not at fault since this lady hadn't actually parked inside a designated parking spot. 
So she was on the hook for her own mirror, which was far more damaged because she didn't secure it from flopping around on the drive home and subsequent driving she did until she got an estimate. She then had the audacity to call my brother, asking if his offer to cover the shop bill still stood. If you've enjoyed the story and would like to hear more, consider liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. Thanks, and bye for now.